Welcome everybody. Um, we're going to talk about chapter 18 today. So basically the idea is open economy macroeconomics. So remember, what is an open economy? Well, actually up until this point in time, all the things that we have learned in the previous chapters have been assuming, I don't know if you guys remember, a closed economy. What does this mean? Well, let's look at the um, identity for GDP. It's consumption plus investment plus government expenditures plus net exports. Consumption plus investment plus government expenditures plus net exports. What have we been assuming about net exports up until now? That these were zero, right? We've been assuming that they're zero. So that's what um, a closed economy means. It means that there's just no trade and we've been, we've been looking at it this way. All right, um, in a closed economy, let's remember, uh, since net exports is zero, this means that y is equal to c plus i plus g. If we move consumption and government expenditures over onto this side, we get y minus c minus g equals investment, right? And we know that total income minus any expenditures we have, right? This is total income of our country minus what we eat, minus what the government expen expends. This is known as our savings. This is how much we save as our country. So that means that saving is equal to investment in a closed economy. Now this only works, remember we, we, uh, we looked at this because in our previous chapters we've seen how in the market for loanable funds when people save then it goes into, they loan it to investors who go and purchase capital. Remember the difference between saving and investing? Investing is the purchase of actual capital. Saving is just not consuming all of your income, right? And it's, it, this is in a closed economy, they're equal. Today we're going to open up this assumption and we're going to go ahead and let net exports not be zero, okay? The reason why we had net exports be zero for the last couple chapters is just because it would throw too much into the model all at once, right? So I just wanted to teach you how the Fed puts money into the system, how the market for loanable funds works, how the market for money works in a simpler model with no exports. And now we're going to go ahead and relax this assumption to make it more realistic, okay? So we're going to learn about exports being, um, being able to be something that's not zero. So this, is this going to hold anymore in this open economy? No, it definitely won't. And I'll, and I'll show you how that, how that happens. Okay, so um, we're going to, we're going to look for the answers to these questions. How are the international flows of goods and services and assets related? Okay. We're going to ask, what's the difference between real and nominal exchange rate? Because suddenly when we open up the world to be able to have exports, suddenly when we open up the world to be able to have exports, we have to convert money from one uh, type of denomination or currency to another. And that's what real and nominal exchange rates are for. And we're going to talk about this idea called purchasing power parity and how it explains the exchange rate. So that's kind of the roadmap of what we'll do um, today in lecture. All right, so uh, remember in, in chapter one we had these principles and this one keeps showing up. Trade can make everybody better off, right? By trade on a country level, at a, at a per country level, trade is exports. So we're going to open up and break this exports equals zero assumption. Um, so we're going to talk about the trade balance, if a country has a trade deficit or a trade surplus. We're going to talk about international flows of assets, um, right? Because money and assets has to travel to another country to an, in order to pay for the imports and exports that the country uses. We'll talk about exchange rates, okay? All right, so let's do a quick review on what's closed versus open. So closed economy, boom. Net exports equals zero. In a closed economy, they don't interact with other economies in the world and savings equals investment in this sort of country. However, in an open economy, we're going to go ahead and take away that this, this net exports equals zero assumption and we're going to allow them to interact freely with other economies, meaning they can go ahead and, um, and trade. Okay, so uh, remember what's, what exports and imports are. So exports are goods produced here locally in this country and sold abroad in other countries. Imports are goods produced abroad in another country and then sold and consumed here. All right, we'll 
for simplicity, we'll assume that the selling and the consumption takes place in the same country, right? So if I say either sold or consumed, I, that's, it's going to be in the same country. All right, and we defined this guy right here, net exports, remember, as exports minus imports. Exports minus imports. This we already uh, defined back when I taught you guys about this identity for the GDP. Um, so let's go ahead and, and, and write that in there so it will be easier to remember. Instead of having net exports, I'm going to change ex uh, net exports to exports. I'm going to change it right here to exports minus imports. It's just so we remember, this whole thing is called net exports, right? This whole thing is called net exports, but it's exports minus imports. All right? And so if you look at this, if you export more than you import. Okay, so imagine that we're this country, United States. We send out more goods to be sold than we bring in. What's this term going to be here? Negative or positive? positive? Positive, exactly. This will be a big number and this will be a smaller number. If, however, we bring in more than we export to other countries, what is the term, uh, what's the sign of this term going to be? Negative, all right? So we, that's why we call that the trade balance, right? When the exports and the imports are the same number, what's net exports? Zero, right? And so there, that gives us a trade balance. However, if we have uh, more exports than imports or more imports than exports, then it's going to be an actual number and we can talk about the balance. Think about this number for the United States, right? In all, in all likelihood, you woke up this morning and maybe you uh, drank some coffee that was grown in Central America and maybe you used your cell phone that was probably made in China and you jumped in a car that was maybe made in Japan, right? In America, this number tends to be very big for us, right? Um, I mean, we export a lot also, but we import far more Right? Our coffee, our cell phones, our cars, our, our everything. We import far more than we export. So the net exports term for the United States is probably what? Negative. It's probably negative, right? This number right here is probably negative. Now, if it's negative for the United States, that means that there's some other country that has to have positive, right, in order to balance it out. Because over the whole world, you can't, the value of net exports over the whole world has to be zero, <laughs> right? The, the number of exports has to equal the number of imports if you look at the whole entire world. But if you just look at one country, right, it's very possible that it can be negative. And in fact, it is very negative um, for the United States. All right, so, but let's, let's think about what kind of things affects the net exports, if it makes it more positive or more negative or zero, all right? So let's imagine, uh, I'll let you guys take a couple seconds and think about this. What would happen to net exports if, all right, Can Can Canadian uh, consumers get poorer, right? So they have falling incomes because Canada is experiencing a recession, all right? What would happen to our uh, uh, net exports? And so in order to think about what happened to our net exports, you kind of have to think about what would happen to our exports and our imports individually, and then think about what would happen. All right? What happens if US consumers decide to be patriotic and buy more products made in the USA? Okay. And or what happens if the prices of goods produced in Mexico rise faster than the prices of goods produced in the United States? So just spend like maybe one or two minutes, you can talk to your neighbor if you want, and, and try to imagine what's going to happen to the value of US net exports this number right here, what's going to happen to this number in each of those three situations? I hear some good, I hear some good conversation going on over there. Very good. So I want, to, I want to point you out and notice that we're actually just looking at what happens to US exports when this happens to Canada, right? So let's, let's think about that. What happens to US net exports when Canada experiences a recession? So what does this mean? Canada experiences a recession, their incomes fall, that's what a recession means, and do they have more or less ability to purchase our goods? They have less. So how is that going to change this right here for the United States? We're thinking about the United States right now. What number here is going to change? Our exports, because they can't buy as much as I previously was selling to them, right? It's, it's probably not going to change our value of imports because, yeah, maybe I import from Canada, but I might import from a whole bunch of other countries. Their, their production still might be okay as far in their import, in their, in their exporting, which is where I import from them, okay? So it's likely um, going to make this number fall, okay? Not do anything to here. 
So we're going to say that US net exports would fall, right? If exports go down and imports stay the same, this whole thing is going to, to fall. Net exports is going to fall. Just because the Canadian consumers can't buy as much of my exports anymore. So my net exports is going down. Does that make sense? All right, let's see what happens if US consumers decide to be more patriotic and buy more products made in the USA. What's going to change here? It's going to change our imports, right? It's not necessarily going to change my exporting sector at all because the other countries aren't going to change, right? If I'm exporting, they're importing. Those import, the other countries aren't going to change their importing habits. It's just me, I'm going to change my importing habits, right? So my imports are going to go down, yes? So what does this value of net exports do? This is being subtracted off. If the number being subtracted goes down, Right. The whole thing go up. Goes up. US net exports rise because the imports is falling. OK? That makes sense? Let's do the third option. Let's say that prices of Mexican goods rise faster than prices of US goods. OK? So, and for simplicity, if you want to imagine there's only two countries for this one, United States and Mexico, you can. So what's going to happen? Think, think, think. Mexican goods. Yeah. So I'm in, a, I'm in the United States, and I'm, I'm looking at my United States net exports. Prices in Mexico are rising faster than prices here. So what goods are people going to buy more of? The goods here in the United States where we are, or the goods over in Mexico? Here, because these prices are rising faster. OK. So let's remember. I'm calculating, people are buying more of United States goods, and I'm calculating net exports for the United States. Okay? So, this is gonna make US goods more attractive than, than Mexico goods. So, people are gonna be buying my stuff, which means I'm exporting more. Yeah? Okay? And furthermore, that means that I'm going to not be importing as much from Mexico because it's more expensive, right? Okay, so exports goes up. Imports goes down. What happens to net exports as a whole? Up, right? This number goes up, this number goes down. So US net exports increase as a whole. Does that make sense? All right. So let's kind of summarize all of the things that uh, influence Net exports, these are the things that we used in, uh, that we looked at in the example problem just a second ago. Okay? So if consumers have a preference for foreign and or domestic goods, that is what's going to one of the things that'll change net exports. Remember the problem, the question I asked you, what happens if people decide to be more patriotic and buy in the USA? Right? For whatever reason, if US goods or or maybe Italian goods or maybe French wine or some good of a specific country becomes more popular or or less popular, right? That'll change the value of net exports, right? Uh, the prices of of goods, right? If prices, if the relative price goes up in Mexico but stays down in, in another country, people are going to buy from the cheaper country. If the goods the same, you might as well buy it from the cheapest country, right? Um, incomes of consumers, right? If people in this country get richer and it's the country that I export to, I'm they're going to buy more of everything, including my exports, right? And so um, I'm going to. It will change the value of my exports. Oh, if the incomes of consumers at home goes up, that means here in the United States, I'm going to buy more of everything, including imports, right? So the value of net exports will go down in that case. Uh, the exchange rate, so we haven't really talked about this yet. We'll talk about this uh, at the end of the chapter, what on earth an exchange rate means. But basically, when I go to buy an import from another country, I can't buy it with US dollars. I have to change my US dollars into the foreign currency in order to buy that. Okay, transportation costs, right? Because it might take a lot of money to uh, to ship goods from one place to another. So that would make the values of both exports and imports both fall. Okay, and of course, government policies such as taxes or um, any sort of trade barriers or or free trade incentives that the government might might give. 
All right, so these are all things that might influence net exports. And you need to be able to, for the purposes of the test, read a story like those three that I just gave you on the last slide. You know, read a story like that and then figure out what it does to net exports. All right, you have to be able to do that. It's not incredibly difficult. You just kind of have to think, sit down and think, OK, I'm in this country, United States. I'm looking at the net exports for the United States, and then another country happens. The students get mixed up because they like know that you know cars are being shipped from Japan to the United States, but then they forget which country they're doing looking at the net exports for. Is it Japan the sending country or is the United States the receiving country? That's when students start to get messed up in figuring out net exports. Does that make sense? The actual story is not that hard to figure out. It's just you got to remember <laughs> where you are. And you could be the the question could ask for the net exports of either of the countries. So you have to be really careful. Okay. All right, so let's uh, talk about trade surpluses and trade deficits. So remember, net exports can be zero if it's a trade balance, but more typically, it's not zero. And therefore, it measures the imbalance in a country's trade or exports and imports in goods and services, right? If exports and imports are exactly equal, well, then net exports is zero. There's no trade imbalance, OK? So if I have more imports than I do exports, I'm going to have a trade deficit. If I have more, uh, more imports than I do exports, I'm going to have a trade deficit. So I want you to look at this GDP identity. And if I have more imports, imports is a big number, exports is a small number, what's the sign of net exports? Negative, right? So you need to associate trade deficit with a negative sign in the net exports, right? So if I say in the test, oh, net exports is negative 200 billion, you have to immediately know that that means that's a trade deficit, which that means that they're importing 200 million dollars more than they're exporting, okay? In the very same way, a trade surplus means you have more exports than you have imports, right? So the sign of net exports is going to be negative, positive. positive, right? Because exports will be bigger and imports will be smaller. So we'll have a positive sign here. And finally, of course, there's the balance trade scenario where imports and exports are the same. And the value of net exports is going to be zero. Now, that doesn't mean they're not trading, right? That doesn't mean they're not trading. but. Um, it just means that exports is equaling imports. Earlier in this class, yes, we had a sign net exports equals zero, but that was under the assumption that they just weren't trading at all. We can also have net exports equaling zero in the world of trade as long as there's exactly balance between exports and imports. If, if, it, if it's balanced trade, does net exports affect the GDP? And the answer is no, actually, right? Because this term is actually zero. So the GDP is just domestic consumption, investment, and goods and services. And in the, in, the, in the world of balanced trade, it's actually also true, since this is zero, that we can you know, derive the fact that investment equals savings. Okay? So in a closed economy, investments all, always equal the savings. But also in an open economy, as long as the trade is balanced, investment still equals savings. Investment doesn't equal savings. It gets messed up only when we have either a trade deficit or a trade um, surplus. Almost every country has either a trade deficit or a trade surplus. Okay, So let's look at the United States. Um, so I've put the value of imports and the value of exports on this time graph for the last 50 or so years. Now, two things I want to point out. One, you guys have already kind of figured out. We import more than we export, right? We import more than we export. All the stuff that you've used today, a lot of it probably was imports, right? And the other thing, in general, look at how much international trade we're doing. In general, it's going up, right? This is like, oh, maybe around 5% of GDP we were doing exports and imports. And now, look, imports have peaked up like almost 20% of GDP uh, um, of our imports, right? That means one out of every $5 that we were spending in 2006, one out of every $5 was for a non-United States good. That's what 20% of GDP means, right? One out of every $5 was for a non-US good. So that's pretty huge. Now, the difference between these two is called the what? Trade deficit or trade surplus? Deficit. Deficit. So the value of net exports here is, zero, is negative. 
Does that make sense? The value of net exports for a lot of years was pretty much zero. You guys see this? Right? And then all of a sudden, it happened in 1981. I don't know. I do not know why it happened in 1981. But all of a sudden, we just started importing more than we exported. Maybe something happened in 1981 that I'm not aware of. Okay? The other interesting thing on this graph is 2008. What happens in 2008? They both fall. And what happened in 2008? We've talked about it many times in this class. What happened in 2008? Who remembers? Recession. The recession, right? And this is right after the housing bubble popped. Remember the credit crunch? There was just, it was a big problem. We've talked about it a couple of times in this class. And imports fell a bunch. What does this mean? Why are imports falling a bunch right here? What does this indicative of? Right. Consumers in the United States, right, because imports, we're buying here, consumers in the United States, their incomes fell, right? So now I was affording all this fancy Gucci Italian purses and French wine and all these other things, right? I was spending one out of five dollars on goods not produced in the United States. All of a sudden, our economy contracts. Whoa. There was a credit crunch and... Um, Nobody, everybody's, everybody's uh, income fell, and so I can't buy all my fancy stuff. You know, I can't buy my uh, Belgian caviar anymore or whatever it was that I was purchasing, right? <coughs> Huge fall. But notice there's also a fall in exports. What caused that? Okay, maybe everyone got fired and, and U.S. exporting firms were not exporting as much, but I think that there's a, another one. Exactly. Other people in other countries were getting poorer too, for two reasons. One, we weren't buying as many of their goods, and so their incomes went down. Two, don't forget, this financial bubble that, that kind of was created in the United States, we were shipping off these uh, um, assets, these, these assets and bonds, which were basically just uh, home mortgages, just all bundled up in packages. We were throwing them to a bunch of different countries. When the housing bubble popped, it, only, it not only hurt us, it hurt all of the other countries that were holding these assets that were actually just bad mortgages, right? So when it popped, it hurt a lot of people, even people who didn't own United States houses, they owned mortgages of United States houses, and then those things became worthless also. So the incomes of the rest of the world fell a bunch also, and they stopped buying our, import, or our, our exports. It was imports for them, it was exports for us, right? So that's why um, in 2008, both you see imports and exports falling. Does that make sense? All right, so, oh, I have a question for you. So this has been going on for a number of years. Imports, we're, we're importing more than we're exporting. So I want you to think that there's a, actually a problem here, okay? Let's imagine there's just two countries. Let's draw this up here. Let's say that there's the United States, there's Florida, it's Texas, it's Washington, okay? And then there's China, let's say. Okay, this is China, all right? So what we know is that, uh, and let's make this model as, as simple as possible. Let's say that we are importing more than we're exporting to China. Let's say that actually that we're just importing and we got no exports. No exports. So just to make this, this is basically the problem the United States has just made a bunch worse, right? Just to make this easy to understand. So let's say we're just importing from China. We're not exporting back to them at all. How do we pay for the imports, right? In the United States, we only have what kind of currency? Dollars. And in China, they have what kind? Anybody know this? China won. Yeah, Japan has yen. Chinese won. Well, how on earth are we going to pay for those, those imports, right? It's, it's imports for us, it's exports for them, right? So how on earth is the United States going to pay China? If they were exporting an equal amount as they were importing, it would be fit, it would be fine, right? Because we just pay for the goods by exporting some goods to them. Well, let me get on this side, right? We would pay for the imports by exporting some of the goods back to them. But now, I just made this really simple. Let's say we don't export at all. Uh, and I'm, I'm getting goods. Okay, so I'm importing all these goods from China. How on earth am I paying for it? Right? This is a huge problem because I don't have Chinese yuan in the United States. Okay? So the idea here is as a country, what we're doing, anytime that there's a trade deficit, meaning I'm importing more than I'm exporting, I have to be 
I have to be giving them something back in return for the imports. Basically, what I'm doing, and the, the easy way I think about it, is you're selling off a little bit of America. Right? What do you offer China in, in exchange for the, export, the imports? They are importing something to you. We're selling off a little bit of America to China. So China somehow is getting a little bit of the United States. Now maybe it's something as simple as, oh look, here's a chunk of territory in Oklahoma, right? In exchange for the imports, we're going to sell this to you. Okay, that's the exchange in the goods and services. Maybe it's as simple as that. This is actually happening a lot vis-a-vis uh, -vis China and the United States. Um, China manages like the entire port of Los Angeles, uh, China, the uh, companies owned by the Chinese government. They're buying up huge swaths of land. They're buying apartment complexes in all, all kinds of places in the United States, right? Because we are importing more than we are exporting to them, okay? The other way that they can do that is by directly setting up a, co a company in America. Anybody remember what it's called when one country sets up another country? Foreign direct investment, right? Okay. So the other way to think about it is that I, they're giving us these goods. We have nothing to pay back to them because we don't export back to them at all. So they are somehow getting a chunk of America. Maybe they're setting up a shop, uh, you know, doing foreign direct investment, and then they're going to get all the proceeds from the from the America and bring it back to China. Does that make sense? We call that the flow of capital. All right, the flow of capital. So it's like the opposite side of the export-import story, right? On one hand, it seems like China buying up pieces of the United States has nothing to do with our exports and imports. On one hand, it seems like it has nothing to do with it. But on the other hand, you see that it actually has everything to do with it. Because the only way that they have... Um, the only way that, that the United States can pay back China is through selling off a piece of it. All right? Here's another way to think of it, okay? And this is maybe a little bit more realistic. In real life, when we, when we get, when the United States imports goods from China, we probably pay them in United States dollars, right? But United States dollars don't work in China. <laughs> the only thing that China can buy with United States dollars is what? Stuff back here in the United States, right? So though, even though, let's say in this really super simplified model where United States is getting more goods and they're not exporting anything, right? They import, they send US dollars, China has to come back and buy up chunks of United States. Whatever it is that they're buying, but they're buying up chunks in the United States. Does that make sense? And that's the flow of capital. So the flow of capital goes back into the United States. Does that kind of make, um, does that, and, and it's really crazy because very few people think about this. This is like the flip side of the coin to the import-export story, right? Import-exports is going on over here, but that ha all has to be paid for somehow if there's not a trade balance. It's the other side of it is the flow of capital, okay? And so we're going to call this net capital outflow. So basically net capital outflow is domestic residence, so if we're in the United States, United States purchases of foreign assets minus foreigners purchase of United States assets. But now, zoom out to the level of the United States, we're actually just indebting ourselves to China, right? Because all rental income that's earned here in the United States, we have to send to China. So basically, when we import more than we export, we're just indebting ourselves to that country. Eventually, we have to end up paying them back somehow. Yeah? And so, uh, in this very, very simplified model, what's the value of net exports if we're only, for the United States? We're, we're, in, we're pretending we're the United States, so I'll get over here when I'm writing this. Right? Net exports is going to be negative, right? Because we're just importing, right? Now, in the same world, right, so China has all these US dollars now. They don't have, they can't spend them in China. They come over here and they buy our assets, they buy up stuff in the United States. What's that going to make to the number of net capital outflow? What's going to happen here? Do we have any domestic residents? Do we have any United States people buying up stuff in China? No. We only have Chinese people buying up stuff in America. So the net capital outflow is going to be what? Negative. Negative also. Okay. So I'm going to write that. NCO, net capital outflow, is also negative in this very simplistic model. Okay. If I'm China. <laughs> 
because I could do this on a test, right? If I'm China, what's the value of my net exports? Positive. Positive. If I'm China, what's the value of my net capital outflow? Positive, because I'm buying up more of their stuff than they are buying of my stuff. OK, does that make sense? So um, and they also call this net foreign investment, because we realize that foreign inve uh, capital outflow is actually just the other country purchasing up um, another country. OK? Net foreign investment. So remember, there's the two types of one country sending money to another country. We talked about this earlier. Um, there's foreign in direct investment, which is where the country goes and they, they send money to the other country by actually building a factory that they're in charge of. Right? So when US opens up a McDonald's in Moscow, right? they're putting all the money into Moscow to build this thing. Right? They're paying all the construction workers. They're paying all the Moscow citizens. Um, they, that's foreign direct investment for the United States. right? When this happens, the value of United States NCO, net capital outflow, what happens? United States NCO increases, gets more positive. Gets more positive. Okay? There's also a foreign portfolio investment, which means I just buy stocks and bonds from that country, and then they can, they can, they can do it. That's basically I'm loaning them funds. That's what a, buy, buying a stock or bond is, right? I'm loaning them funds. So I'm supplying loanable funds to the firm. Okay. In this case, if this happened in the United States, if United States citizens buy stocks on the FTSE, that's the stock exchange in London, right? They're buying up London stocks for, in, for English companies. The at net capital outflow, NCO, for the United States goes up. Okay. So let's come back to our super simple model of the United States and China. Right? We're importing a bunch, not exporting at all. So our net exports is negative. That means that they have a bunch of US dollars. What do you think a lot of Chinese people do with their US dollars? They buy stocks from United States companies. Does that make sense? That's foreign portfolio investment. And that makes our NCO go down too because they're sending the money back and buying our stuff, right? So in essence, the full circle looks like this. We are getting imports from them and we're paying for their imports by sending back ownership of our companies, stocks, right? We ultimately have to, United States, okay, we're in the United States, so I'm going to stay on this side. <laughs> We're importing. We ultimately have to pay for those somehow. We're sending back something else very, very valuable, stocks to them. In the, in the case where uh, they're, they're taking foreign portfolio investment. right? Maybe they're buying up actual chunks of the United States, in which case we're sending back ownership of property. Okay? This is the way that we are paying for our imports. Okay? People don't really... Think, ever think about this when we import more than we export? We have to be paying for it somehow. So we have not, this is a good question. You might be thinking, wait a sec, can I just take these and convert them into yuan? Yes, they can, but we haven't quite talked about how that process works. In order to convert dollars into yuan, you have to find somebody who has yuan and wants to buy dollars, right? And so you're still, you're still at that same problem, right? You still have to you're not able to actually buy Chinese goods with dollars, right? You're just, you're just not able to. So um, I'm just simplifying that step out of here. And it doesn't actually change the picture at all if somebody converts them first to one, OK? Because that person who gave you one and has dollars is now going to take those dollars and do what? Buy the, buy the thing that you were going <laughs> to, the Chinese person was going to buy in the United States. It's the same, it's the same thing, OK? All right. So. Um, just like net exports measures the imbalance in the country's goods and services, net, uh, net uh, capital outflow measures the imbalance in the country's trades in assets. All right? So think about when NCO is greater than zero. Net capital outflow is greater than zero.
right? So if your net capital outflow is positive, that means people in your country are buying up other countries' stuff more than other people are buying up your country's stuff. All right. Now in the same, same token, when net capital outflow is negative, that means capital is flowing into your country. In other words, right, people are buying up your stuff more than you're buying up other countries' assets. Okay, and then of course, oh, when, oops, it's not on the slide. When net capital outflow is, is zero, one of two things could ha be happening. One, nobody's buying up anything. <laughs> or two, more likely, people are buying up your stuff and you're buying up other people's stuff at the exact same amount. In my super simple model right here, who has a negative net capital outflow? United States does, absolutely. United States has negative net capital outflow. On the other hand, China has a positive net capital outflow, right? China owns more of United States stuff than United States owns of China stuff, right? And again, I'm going to say this one more time, even though I've said it a million times. People don't really understand that this is completely connected to the world of exports and imports, right? Because this net capital outflow occurs in the world of like Wall Street, right? Uh, people buying stocks and bonds from the United States. And then the exports and imports is in the realm of manufacturing, right? They, they seem like two completely different worlds, right? But the fact of the matter is, it's the same dollars. <laughs> the dollars we're sending them to their imports are the dollars that, that gets transferred over to the financial sector and then they spend them on our United States companies. Isn't that interesting? It's really interesting. Two worlds you would never have thought were connected are completely exactly connected. Okay? So what kind of things influence the net capital outflow? Well, the interest rates paid on the foreign assets. Right? So if I can get a good interest rate by buying up something over here in this country, I will. If it's better than the interest rate I can get on something in America, right? Um, if the real interest rates paid on the things in America are less than the foreign assets, I will buy foreign assets. If the real interest rates on stuff in America are higher, then people will buy um, the assets in America, okay? There, of course, is the risks of holding foreign and domestic assets, right? So the risk, if it's more risky to hold foreign assets, I'll probably hold United States assets, okay? Government policies, right? There's all kinds of government policies affecting foreign ownership of domestic assets. In, in, in America, we see this all the time, particularly with the fact that Chinese companies have all of these US dollars. They're trying to buy up US stuff because that's the only thing your US dollars are going to work on is US stuff. Um, you know, there's all kinds of people who cry out when the Chinese government or Chinese companies or Chinese individuals buy chunks of land or when, they, when they're in charge of things in the United States, right? Generally uh, associated with kind of national security concerns, all right? So here's the cool thing that we've been building up to, right? The dollars of that the dollars that we pay them for their, their imports, let me come over here because I'm the United States, right? So the dollars that we pay them for their imports, that makes our net exports negative, is the same dollars they come over here and buy our stocks with, which makes our NCO equal or negative. So it just so happens that these are the same exact number all the time. Right? Does that make sense? And they've got to be the same exact number all the time. Okay? Every transaction that affects net exports also affects net capital outflow by the same amount and vice versa because of this super simple model that I just drew over here for you. So let's imagine, right? When a foreigner purchases a good from the United States, okay, so I'm in the United States, when someone else purchases, this is one of my exports, what happens, right? My net exports goes up because they purchase one of my exports. Yeah? But then what happens? They pay me in whatever country that money that they have, right? So now I have country, their country money, and I can go buy a stock in their country, right? That's going to make my net capital outflow go up, right? So when NX goes up for the United States because somebody bought my export, they pay me in, I don't know, Russian rubles, and I take those rubles and I go buy something from Russia which makes the net capital outflow of the United States also go up. 
That makes sense. Net exports, net capital outflow goes up. I think this simple model kind of explains it really easily. On the other hand, when a US citizen buys foreign goods, that's the picture that's going on here. The US citizens are buying Chinese goods, so the imports rise, net exports is negative, right? All these Chinese citizens have a bunch of US dollars that they can't do anything except for send to the United States to buy stuff. So the money is going back into the United States, which makes the net capital outflow of the United States negative, because net capital outflow is actually not outflowing, it's actually inflowing. So it's negative net at capital outflow. Pretty interesting, huh? You never probably would have thought that uh, the value of exports and imports had something to do with the value of international transfers of stock ownership. <laughs> but it's actually exactly equal because those are the dollars that people use. All right, so uh, now we've really kind of mucked up this world of savings equals investment. Remember at the very beginning, I pointed out that when net exports are zero, saving is always equal to investment by this uh, um, identity right here. Well now, if we got money flowing into the country and money getting out of the country, investment and savings don't have to be anything the same, okay? So uh, let's, let's do it in the open economy world. At the beginning of the class, before, the, before I started the slideshow, I gave you how we find that savings equal investment in the closed economy world. Now let's do it in the open economy world, right? So I have y equals c plus i plus g plus nx, all right? I'm gonna move uh, c and g on this side, right? Now I have y minus c minus g equals i plus nx, right? Before, in the closed economy case, it's just that, right? And I know that what's this equal to, y minus c minus g? savings, right? Because this is total income minus total expenditures. Basically, whatever's left over here is savings. So I know this side is still savings, but savings no longer equal to investment anymore. It's savings equal to investment plus net exports, right? So that's what I've got right there. Savings equal to investment plus net exports. And furthermore, I know that net exports is actually always equal to net capital outflow. This is really cool, right? This is really cool how this is working out. So basically, here's what I know. In a country such as in America, has negative net capital outflow, right? Negative. That means however much investment is going on in America, so think of investment as the building of buildings, right? Because that's investment or the buying up of land, right? We subtract off NCO, net capital outflow, because the United States has a negative net capital outflow, right? So let's say that people built $100 million worth of buildings. That's capital investment, right? But 50 million of it, we, we imported more than we exported. That means our net capital outflow is going out. That means the domestic saving of people in the United States is 100 million total investment minus the $50, we, $50 million we got from other countries because they had extra US dollars laying around. So the, the domestic savings, the savings of people in the United States is less. It's actually only $50 million and the investment is $100 million. Does that make sense? Before, when we didn't have NCO, savings had to equal investment. But now, investment is fueled both by United States people's savings and other countries sending me back their US dollars that are just sitting around because they, we imported too much. Does that make sense? So that means that when savings, well, I give you the opposite idea, but the, the, it works the other way too. When savings is more than investment, right? When the United States saves more, or when, let's do another country. When China saves more than it needs for investment, what do they do? They send that money to other countries. And that's positive net capital outflow, right? And this is, the, this is the example of the United States, right? When savings is less than investment, foreigners are financing some of the investment, right? They're sending, the, sending me the money to the United States. So if you want on your notes to mark this down, the case where savings is greater than investment, make that, the, make that China over here, right? They've got extra dollars to send back to, to the United States, right? So there's, 
the net capital outflow, flow, capital's flowing out of China, which is really kind of a good thing because yes, dollars are sending out, but they're getting valuable stocks and bonds in return or something, valuable assets in return, right? The, uh, when the savings is less than investment, that's, think of that as us in the United States, right? We're not saving very much, but we're building all kinds of things, all kinds of investment. We're not saving that much. Where's that money coming from? Foreign countries, right? And, and it's kind of like this big twisted cycle, right? In the United States right now, we are not saving that much, but we need, have a lot of need for investment. So the difference between the two of them is being funded by foreigners are loaning us money, right? Because we save not enough, but we need a lot for investment. So foreigners are sending us extra money to, the, to make it up, right? Well, why is the United States not saving enough? Well, because that money that we could be saving, we're taking and we're spending on the imports from other countries, right? So at, at the country level, it's all twisted up and related, okay? All right. Uh, so let's think about the United States a little bit more uh, specifically. So let's look at the actual numbers from the United States, okay? So remember uh, that on that graph, we looked at how far apart they got? They were the farthest apart in 2006. They were the farthest apart, right? Because the distance between imports and exports was my trade deficit. They were the farthest apart in 2006. They both kind of fell in 2008, but they still stayed far apart, right? They still stayed far apart. So remember, net exports is equal to savings minus investment, which is equal to, to uh, net capital outflow, right? That's just from the previous slide. OK, so if you have a trade deficit, that means that these, this number is negative, right? That means that which number is bigger here? Clearly, the investment has to be bigger. In order to make this negative, the investment has to be bigger. So it means investment is greater than savings, right? So that means United States is needing money to invest but doesn't have enough from United States savings, so they have to pull in money from foreigners who are going to, to, say, to send us uh, money to invest, okay? So, here you go. In 2007, foreign purchases of US stuff was $775 million more than US purchases of foreign stuff, right? So this gets a little more complicated than my simple model here because one, there's more than one country, and two, yes, United States does actually export and they do send over money, but we just look at the, the difference, right? We look at the fact that yes, United States bought stuff from other countries, but other countries bought more of the United States than United States people bought of other countries. Does that make sense? Okay. So uh, 775 million. So uh, remember that these deficits started on the graph. It looked like it was you know, around 1980, right? On the graph, I think it was exactly like 1981 when they split, right? And I told you I don't really know exactly why, but they've been around since 1980, OK? And so if, if I look, now here's a new graph. I'm not going to give you the exports and imports graph. I'm going to give you the, the financial markets graph. Check this out, right? Uh, since 1980, we net capital outflow pretty much hovered around zero. Why did net capital outflow hover around zero? Well, because exports and imports were equal, remember? But then in 1981, remember what happened? We started importing more. So that means our value of net exports got negative. That means our value of net capital outflow got negative. So all of a sudden, starting in 1980, boom, look what happens. We get negative. Does everybody see that? So we've been, we've been negative the whole time. Here we are super negative, look at negative 6%. Okay, we've been pretty much negative. Which means that, let's look up here. What does that mean? That means that the amount that we were saving as a United States country was not enough for our investment needs, right? The difference between these two is the amount of money we're getting from foreigners to invest, right? I, if I look from here from zero to this point, that's how much I invested, but only up to here, was paid for by United States dollars. This was paid by foreigner dollars. OK, does that make sense? And it's all connected to the exports and imports graph I showed you earlier, right? Now, I don't want you to think that you're like, oh, well, this is happening because net exports are negative. I'm not really sure which one causes which. <laughs> if, it's, if it's the fact that we need more investment and we're not saving enough that's causing the net exports problem, or if it's the net exports problem that's causing the NCO problem, 
Does that make sense? I'm not sure which is which. Is which. I'm just telling you both of them are happening at the same time. Okay? And so you see right here was 2006, right? Remember that was the year that exports and imports were the farthest apart? It's also the year that investments and savings are the farthest apart. By definition, right? We know that it has to happen because the money was just coming back to the United States. Okay? Pretty interesting stuff, huh? I think so. So let's keep thinking. So why does the United States save less than investment? Here's some ideas. Um, in the 1980s and the early 2000s, the, and even now, the government was running huge budget deficits, right? And remember back from the chapter on national saving is that when the government spends more than it takes in, that's a budget deficit, right? It's sucking up money from somewhere. It's sucking up money from the savers. Okay, it's sucking up money from the savers, right? So we don't have enough national savings, which means we are not saving enough to build the buildings and farms and whatever investment that we need, right? In the 1990s, right, national saving did in fact increase because in the 1990s, remember Bill Clinton was president and he ran actually budget surpluses where we had extra money in the United States government, which was good for savings, but at the same time in the 1990s, so you would think, well, hey, I have enough savings now. Why is my investment higher than my savings still if I have a lot of savings? Well, those were also years of, of growth. It was a boom for our GDP, right? So all kinds of companies were needing to invest even more or were wanting to invest even more. So even though our saving went up, our investment needs went up a lot more because we were growing as a country. So our investment still stayed more than our savings in the 1990s. Okay, so every year, right? In the 80s and 2000s, it was because we weren't saving enough. In the 90s, we were saving a lot, but we were wanting to invest even more. Okay. So, is this a problem, right? It kind of seems a little weird, right? We're basically funding all of our invest, a lot of our investment here in the United States with dollars from other countries. In other words, we're basically getting ourselves indebted to these other countries. Does that make sense? All right. So, one thing you might say no, because yeah, we borrowed a lot of money from them for our investments, but our investments are going to pay off. Like we built a bunch of extra companies and factories and now we're making a bunch more products and that's going to boom for us and, and it's going to be good, right? It's going to grow our, our GDP and we can easily pay back any sort of interest rates that we need to pay back to these people um, uh, with, with our extra GDP that came about because we invested so much, okay? Don't forget Way back in, I think it was chapter 12, when we talked about the production function for the United States, remember one of the inputs for, for GDP was capital. Remember the inputs for GDP? There's capital, physical capital, human capital, natural resources, right? So by that same argument, we can say, yeah, it's, it's a bummer that we had to borrow a bunch of money to make our capital go up, but I know that when capital goes up, my GDP goes up, so it'll be all right, right? That's one argument, okay? Um, and so the, the, sa the same idea here is saying, yeah, it's a bummer the United States government w in the 80s and the 2000s was running a budget deficit, meaning there wasn't enough savings to going on in our country, but it would have been really bad if our, country, or if our companies couldn't invest what they wanted because there wasn't enough money. At least the companies could go to foreigners and get foreign money and it helped them still stay strong and still grow and make our GDP still increase, right? So you might have that argument that no, it's not that bad because really investment in capital is productive and it's going to make our GDP go up, right? And so the idea here is like, imagine that it's the same argument for a person, right? You can go into debt for good reasons and for bad reasons. <laughs> a bad reason to go into debt is if you just want to go into debt to go party in Las Vegas for two straight years, right? A good reason to go into debt is if you borrow money to invest it and maybe make a, your own company, right? If you need to borrow money to start a company, maybe that's a good reason. Or if you need to borrow money to get human capital, education, maybe those are good reasons because it's going to make you more productive in the long run, right? So the idea here is 
The trade deficit is not necessarily a bad thing, because basically a trade deficit, what that means is that we're borrowing from the outside world, right? From the foreign countries. If we're borrowing it and using it to make productive investments, maybe not that bad of a not maybe not that big of a problem. But right, if it just means that we're overspending, that could be a simple symptom of a really big problem. All right. So um, this is uh, information I haven't quite updated recently, but uh, as of October 31st, 2013, so it was the last time I taught this class. Um, People abroad own $25.8 trillion in U.S. assets. That means other people own $25.8 trillion of United States stuff. And United States people owned $21.6 trillion of foreign stuff. Okay? So you see the difference in here? That's $4 trillion. That's a lot of money. The difference in that is because at the end of every year, right, we've imported more than we've exported. So there's more US dollars sitting around there. So people use those US dollars to buy more of our stuff than we can afford to buy of their stuff. That's where the difference there comes, that $4 trillion. Okay? Now this might be a problem because right, we're indebted by $4.2 trillion. And no other country is, is more indebted to other countries than the United States. This is higher than uh, every other country. We're the world's biggest debtor nation. We owe the the most to the rest of the world, okay? And this could be a really big problem if, for example, we have to pay interest rates to these people that have 25.8, that have loaned us, basically the way to think of this, people have loaned us $25.8 trillion to build capital, right? We've loaned other people $21.6 trillion. Well, everybody's earning interest rate on the loans that they've made to the other countries. The problem is, we're, there's this 4.2 trillion extra dollars that we owe to other people that people don't owe to us, right? So yes, I'm getting interest rate on this 21.6 trillion, but I have to pay interest rates on 25.8 trillion. So I might have to pay interest rate, more interest rates than what I'm getting as income as interest from other countries. Does this make sense, right? This could be a really big problem. So you can look at it like this. Basically, we have a debt of $4.2 trillion to the rest of the world that we have to pay interest on, right? That could be really bad for our national income, right? Now, right now, it's not a problem. Why? Well, because when people loan us money, the United States, we don't pay very high interest rates to them because people are see the United States is seen as very secure and not risky. Does that make sense? So for non-risky, safe assets, you pay low interest rates, right? The amount of money we've loaned to other countries, it's, it's a little bit more risky, so the interest rates are higher. So even though we owe them more than they owe us, the amount of interest payments is kind of a wash because we're getting more interest on this money and they're getting less interest on this money, so the total amount of interest is about the, is about the same right now, right? But that, that could easily change. Does that make sense? That could easily change, right? So there's, there's two problems. If the US debt continues to grow, eventually I'm going to be paying more interest than I'm getting. And then that's a problem for our national income, right? And then uh, the other option, which I don't actually have on here, is, oh, right here, if foreigners demand higher interest rates. Because people are like, whoa. United States is getting really, really indebted. It's not quite as safe to loan them any more money, right? So it's going to be seen as more risky. So they're going to want higher interest rates, which the higher interest rate could then, could then wreck this, this balance right now also. Okay. Oh, look at this really, how are, the question is how are we indebted to other country? Look at this real simple model here, okay? China is purchasing st with, okay, sending us imports, we're sending them US dollars, they're taking the US dollars, and they're buying stocks, okay? So who owns the stocks? China. Yeah. Who's the owners of the US companies, actually? China. Yeah. The people who own the stocks are the people who are the owners of the company, right? So let's imagine a company, this is not really true, but let's imagine a company like Hewlett Packard, right? Let's say that China took and they bought all of HP's stocks, Hewlett Packard. They actually own Hewlett Packard. We're, the company is here, right? But it has to send all profits and everything over to China, right? 
in, in essence, we're indebting ourselves to China. We basically said, look, China, we took too many imports from you, so here's Hewlett Packard. <laughs> you can just have it, right? That's how I'm going to pay for your imports. I am in the United States, I'm indebted to, to you, so I'm giving you Hewlett Packard. Now, that's a really simple model. Really, what happens is, right, people are owning, it goes through the financial markets and people own stocks and bonds. But the same idea, right? If people buy, instead of buying Hewlett Packard, if they bought a bunch of United States government bonds, who owes who? Yeah, right? If China bought a bunch of US bonds, who owes who? The United States owes China. That's what a bond is, right? They take an IOU, right? So most inter-country debt exchanges go on in US dollars. Even, even if, I don't know, Belgium buys debt from Zaire, <laughs> generally it goes on in US dollars, just because that's, that's the... Um, standard currency of the world. However, that doesn't mess up this model. Imagine this was uh, Belgium and Zaire and they were doing in US dollars. It's the, 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 the thing still holds. Yes, they have to go through and find someone who's got Belgian, whatever they have in Belgian, to change them in US dollars and then the US dollars have to get changed back into Zaire dollars or something like that. It just adds a couple more steps. But the picture looks the exact same. Okay? All right. So, the answer to the question, is the U.S. trade deficit a problem? Maybe. <laughs> uh, right now it's not, but it could be a problem in the future. Okay? That makes sense. All right. So, now we're going to talk about the nominal exchange rate. Um, thus far in this chapter, in order to make it more simple, we just were kind of imagining imports and exports and just kind of dollars flowing from one country to another. Um, to kind of, so we can understand how this net exports and then net capital outflow thing worked. Now we're going to go ahead and put back in the actual part that we all know about. Dollars have to be exchanged into other currencies in order to be used in other countries, right? And this happens, it's called the exchange rate, okay? And so the nominal exchange rate is the rate at which one country's currency can be converted into another country's currency. We just call it a nominal exchange rate. Right. Remember the difference between nominal and real, right? We've been hitting this like every single chapter, but just as a review, right? Nominal measures something in dollars or currency, or whatever the other currency of their country is, right? Real measures in goods. Right? So if I have the nominal wage, that's just how many dollars I actually get paid. The real wage is how much stuff I can buy with my wage. Right? The same way. Nominal exchange rate is just taking one dollar and changing it into a euro. And whatever the, how much they trade for, how much you can convert it, that's the nominal exchange rate. Real exchange rate is how much a good can be exchanged for another good in another country. Right? So I have a a car over here, a Toyota Sequoia, I convert that into money, I convert, take that nominal exchange rate, I, then I buy how much of a other Toyota Sequoia can I buy, right? If I look at the, the exchange rate between the, the two goods, that's the real exchange rate. Does that make sense? Yes. So the way that we normally express exchange rates are nominal exchange rates. And we express them as how much of that money can my money here buy. So here we have dollars, right? So in this class, and um, always in America, if you go to the airport, you're always going to look at how much that one dollar can buy. So uh, this one I did change. I changed it last night. Um, I just updated these. So here's the most current things. One dollar can buy one Canadian dollar, 13 Canadian cents, right? A dollar. So one dollar can buy one dollar and thirteen worth of Canadian currency. One dollar buys 0.8 euro. It's actually like 0.7999 or whatever, right? Rounded to 0.8. Okay. It can buy one dollar can buy 112.67 Japanese yen. Right. So really think about it. Our Japanese yen is more like our cent, really, if you think about it. Right. And then it can we can buy about 13.47 Mexican pesos. One dollar buys thirteen points of the Mexican pesos. Right. So the other way to look at it is, on the other hand, if you're in Mexico and you need dollars, it takes thirteen point four seven pesos to buy a dollar, so that you can 
buy whatever a dollar buys in America, right? So you're on a trip, you're going from Mexico to America. You pay 13.47 Mexican pesos, buy a dollar, and then use that dollar when you're in America. Okay? Don't people try and make a lot of money on trading, shirt, currency exchanges? So, uh, if people do try to make a lot of money, it's called foreign, foreign exchange trading, or Forex. Um, you know, if this changes just a little tiny bit. If you can, let's imagine, buy, today it's, uh, the Canadian dollar is 1.13. So you take your dollar and you move it into Canadian dollars real quick, now you have a dollar per team Canadian dollars. But then let's say all of a sudden this drops down to $1.10, right? Well now you have $1.13 in Canadian dollars, but you only need $1.10 of it to buy the U.S. dollar that you originally had yesterday, right? So now you move that over there, you'll have the U.S. dollar you had yesterday, and you start out with plus three Canadian cents, right? And that's how people try to make money in foreign exchange, okay? Um, and that is actually some of the big reasons why uh, exchange rates are the way they are, okay? And, but it's extremely difficult to make money. Uh, so that's called an arbitrage opportunity, by the way. Any, anytime you see like the same good that's two different prices, and if you just move your money from one to the other place, that you can make some money without actually doing any work or any production. That's called arbitrage. And it's really difficult because the second these, they get a, like a little bit out of line, people who are looking at it and they have millions of dollars they can throw right in it, right? And it goes from the US dollar to the Canadian dollar. That makes the demand for the Canadian dollar go up and the de demand for the US dollar go down because they can move like a million dollars and go right back to where they should be, right? So they very rarely get out of whack, very rarely. Yes, sir? Why do, the, why do they change? Why do they change? Um, yeah, we'll get into it a little bit, but the most basic idea is because of demand. If somebody wants more Canadian dollars and less U.S. dollars, right, uh, for some reason, let's say everybody in the United States decided to take a vacation to Canada today. <laughs> We're all going to need to buy Canadian dollars. Right? That means the demand for Canadian dollars is going to go up. The demand for U.S. dollars is going to go down. Right? That means this number is going to get smaller. Okay? Does that make sense? Because that means the United States dollar is weaker, so I can't quite buy quite as many Canadian dollars. Does that make sense? Because you know everybody wants to buy Canadian dollars. Okay? And so this is called appreciation. If 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 everybody decides to go on on vacation to Canada. That makes the Canadian dollar get really strong. The demand for Canadian dollar, just like the supply and demand curve for any good, right? And so it's going to make an appreciation. It's going to make a Canadian dollar appreciate. Basically, it's, it's also known as strengthening, going up. It's an increase in the value of a currency as measured by the amount of foreign currency it can buy. Okay. And in my example, when we all decided to go to Canada, the Canadian dollar appreciated. The United States dollar depreciated, right? That's why that number went down because the United States dollar can't buy quite as much United the Canadian dollars anymore because it's weaker. And so it's called depreciating, right? A lot of my students get confused, you know, if the exchange rate is one to a dollar thirteen and then it goes from one to a dollar ten. People think that, oh, that must be depreciating, but no, that means the Canadian dollar is getting stronger. It's the U.S. dollar that's depreciating. So, in 2007, just, just uh, to give you an example, it depreciated 9.5% against the euro. But it even appreciated 1.5% against the South Korean won. That is a real good question. We're going to talk about the real purchasing power of currency later in this class. But that is the, ultimately, this is this is really what you should all be thinking of. I don't care about the nominal exchange rate. What I really care about is when I go on my vacation to Canada, how much stuff I can buy. That's a real exchange rate, right? Honestly, we actually just care about the real exchange rate. Um, I want to show you something when we when we give exchange rates, right, so we, I just had over there, dollar buys 113 Canadian dollars, right? If tomorrow it goes to this, a lot of people look at this and say, oh, the Canadian dollar depreciated, because it kind of looks like it, right? It went down. But actually what happened here? 
The dollar used to be able to buy $1.13 Canadian, but then today, now my dollar can only buy $1.10 Canadian. So actually, what depreciated? The US dollar, okay? So we say that US dollar depreciated. And because there's a lot of other currencies out there, you have to say with respect to the Canadian dollar. Actually, Canadian dollar CAD, I think. CAD. Okay. Um, and then Canadian dollar appreciated with respect to US dollar. Okay. Because at the same time, the U.S. dollar depreciated with respect to Canadian dollars. It might have appreciated with respect to another dollar, another currency. Okay. So just don't get confused about that. I mean, I, I used to live overseas when I was in high school, and I would just always get confused about which direction these, when these numbers are changing. Like, wait, am I able to buy more stuff when I get to where I'm going, or less stuff? I can never remember, right? So this is how I figured it out in my brain. This is just from coming, going through the, the airports. And then, of course, in the airport, they put in a whole other level of complexity because if you buy them versus you sell them, they give you two different exchange rates so that they can make a little bit of money on the transaction. So now there's like two exchange rates for every uh, denomination. It's a bit of a, a, bit of a hassle. But anyway, uh, so that's the general idea between appreciation and depreciation. Okay, but really what we care about is the real exchange rate. We actually, this, I've said this probably almost every chapter, I don't actually care about the nominal blank. I always care about the real blank, whatever it is per chapter that I'm talking about, right? So remember that the real exchange rate is if I take how much of this good in this country can I buy of this good in the other country, right? So that's the real exchange rate when I'm talking about it in, in, in the goods. And here's how I write it. Okay, so the real exchange rate is equal to this function where P is the price here, the price of the good here. P star is the price of the good over there in their, in their currency, whatever it is. And then E is the nominal exchange rate. Okay, so this is the way we're going to think about this. And, and here's the idea. I have my Toyota Sequoia here, and I'm looking in... in uh, Russia, right? How much of my Toyota Sequoia is worth, say, forty thousand dollars here? I want to know how much it's worth over there. Well, I have to take my uh, price here, forty thousand dollars, times it by the exchange rate. Then I just took forty thousand dollars. Then I just turned it into Russian rubles, right? And then I divide it by the price over there. So I see how much of a Toyota Sequoia I can buy over there, right? Maybe I can buy more than a Toyota Sequoia. Maybe I can only buy three quarters of a Toyota Sequoia over there, right? Does that make sense? That's what this form, if, if it spits out and it says 0.81, that means that the value of my Toyota Sequoia here, when I translate it over into Russian rubles, it will only buy 0.81 of a Toyota Sequoia over there. That's what that means. Does that make sense? All right, so here's an example. Uh, super simple, right? All my models, as super simple possible. Let's look at Big Macs. Now, I want to tell you something, that across the world, the, this is not a joke, actually. Big Macs are used as like one of the primary indicators of the price levels in different countries. Okay? Yeah, it's actually one of the number, the top economists use it. They look to compare prices of Big Macs in different countries. It's very interesting. The two things that almost all economists check on is, and this is funny, but I'll tell you why. Big Macs and haircuts. <laughs> Those are the two things that everybody, uh, that all of the top economists checks when we're looking at prices between two countries. So the reason why Big Macs are really useful is because it's the same good in every single country. And you know, we know McDonald's are everywhere, right? So I can just peek in and I can see how much a Big Mac costs in this country, how much it costs in this country, how much it costs in this country, and it's the exact same item, right? So it's really, really useful, okay? So it costs two dollars and fifty cents in the United States, four hundred yen in Japan. Um, these are just a little rounded to make the math nice. And let's imagine that the exchange rate is one hundred twenty yen per U.S. dollar, right? Right now it's actually like one hundred thirteen, but that would make the math a little harder. So let's just round it to one hundred twenty to make the math easy, right? Okay. So let's go ahead and convert. We
we know the nominal exchange rate is 120 yen per dollar. 120 yen per dollar. We know it's a nominal exchange rate. But we don't really care about that. What we care about is the real exchange rate between Big Macs. Okay? So I'm going to take my United States Big Mac that's worth 250, right? And then I'm going to change the two dollars and fifty cents into Japanese currency, right? That's this right here. This is how much my P is how much the Big Macs cost here in America. Times and times E, which means now I just took that 250 and I moved it into Japanese money, right? Does that make sense to everybody? And so that is going to be 300 yen, right? So my US Big Mac, I take it's 250. I move that 250 into Japanese currency and now I have 300 yen. And now I look at how much of a Japanese Big Mac I can buy with that 300 yen. All right, so I take 300 yen and I divide it by the, the actual Japanese price, it's 400 yen. Okay, so what is the exchange rate? 0.75. Meaning my Big Mac here, when I transfer it into Japan, it's only worth 0.75 Big Macs. Okay. So on the real exchange rate, who's got the more expensive Big Macs? Using the real exchange rate. Okay. Japan, right? Exactly. Because when I move a United States Big Mac over to Japan, it only is 0.75 of the Japan Big Mac. Okay. So if you were like, born to buy a car, and you just ignore shipping costs, um, can you try and do this and see if it might be more, it might be better to buy it? It's very true. So people can buy a car, if you can ignore shipping costs, should you look at, at the real exchange rate? Absolutely. And you know, there's a lot of people actually who do this. Um, they want to buy a BMW. This is very common for BMWs. And the real exchange rate of BMWs, the BMWs are much cheaper in Germany. All right? So people go to Germany and they buy a BMW. Now, then this, there's this other thing. If you take a brand new BMW and you ship it to America, then there's a bunch of taxes because it's new. So you just drive it around for a couple hundred miles, take a vacation in Germany. It's a used car now, and then they can ship it back for really cheap. And then they get this, and the real exchange rate is much lower. Right? It's very common to do, actually. Uh, all right, so that's the exchange rate. Now, what does this mean, right? The real exchange rate, 0.75 Japanese Big Macs per US Big Mac. Does that mean if you grab a Big Mac in, in the United States, and you hop on an airplane, and you flew to Japan, and you got there, it would just all of a sudden just be three quarters of a Big Mac? No, not necessarily, right? That's, that's insane. What it means is that to buy a Big Mac in the United States, Right? A Japanese citizen must sacrifice an amount that he could purchase 0.75 Big Macs in Japan. All right. So was, again, if this guy from Japan comes to the United States and buys a Big Mac, he's like, oh, that feels to me like it feels like when I buy 0.75 Big Macs of, uh, uh, in Japan. Does that make sense? Or on the flip side, right? When the United States guy goes to Japan to buy a Big Mac, he's like, oh, this feels like one and a third times more expensive than I'm normally paying when I buy a Big Mac in America. Okay? I don't understand the real exchange right now. Very good question. So Big Mac's indicative of general levels of prices. Very true. So when we go to Japan, does it feel different? Yes. But think about this. When I go to Japan, I, with the amount of money I usually use to spend to buy one Big Mac, I get there and only buys three quarters of a Big Mac, which means that I feel poorer in Japan. Everything else feels more expensive in Japan. And that's true, because I've been there a lot of times, right? And everything feels more expensive in Japan, right? Because the real exchange rates are perhaps a little higher. Now, I mean, in a couple of slides we're going to get into this, like, should this really be different? It should be pretty close to the same, really, because, I mean, it's the same good. Theoretically, you could buy a bunch of Big Macs, freeze them real quick, ship them on an airplane, put them over to Japan and sell them and make a profit or something like that, right? Because then they'd be cheaper. All right. So compute a real exchange rate is what I want you to do. Let's imagine that the nominal exchange rate is 10 pesos per dollar. Okay? And I'm gonna get you, you're going to get a tall Starbucks latte. Remember, tall is small. Starbucks, it's weird, right? So let's say that you pay $3 and you know what you ask, 
24 pesos in Mexico, I want you to measure, first find the price of a U.S. latte in pesos, and then find the real exchange rate. Alright, so let's measure the price of a U.S. latte in pesos. So basically, I take my $3 in the United States, right, because it's the price of the latte, and I move it to Mexico, and I change it into pesos. So how much is it going to be? If I take my $3 and I move it into Mexico, how much pesos will I have? Pesos. I'll have 30. 30 pesos, right? My U.S. latte is 30 pesos over here. Very good. Now, what is the real exchange rate? Meaning, how many lattes in Mexico can I buy with that 30 pesos? Well, I just divide. 30 divided by 24, right? To make it only 1.25 Mexican lattes, U.S. latte. Right? So the idea here is that my one latte in America, I take the, the money for that, I move it over to Mexico, and suddenly I can buy 1.25 lattes, right? Another way to say it, when I go from on vacation to Mexico, I feel richer, right, comparatively, which is, which is also true to those of us who have been to Mexico, right? It's, it's the opposite of when we go to Japan. In Japan, my dollar, my Big Mac money didn't even buy a full Big Mac. <laughs> But in Mexico, my Starbucks money buys more Starbucks than I actually even need. Does that make sense? So the real exchange rate is 1 to 1.25. Good question. So Mexico's close, and if you could, if you could just easily, costlessly go to Mexico and pick up the good, everybody should be going to Mexico to buy their Starbucks, right? Because it's cheaper there, okay? So this is the idea that we're going to start talking about, is that for goods that are easily transported, the real exchange rate should be one to one, right? Otherwise, people are going to, this is called arbitrage, right? They're going to go down to Mexico, buy a bunch of Starbucks, bring them back to America, and then make money on it. And then everybody's going to start doing that, and so what's going to happen? The demand for Mexican lattes is going to go up, the demand for U.S. lattes is going to go down, which is going to make the price of the Mexican latte go up, the price of the U.S. latte go down, and the exchange rate will come to one-to-one -one naturally. Right? That's how exchange, the real exchange rate ends up being one-to-one. -one. It's because people start buying in different places. Okay? And that's, that's a theory that, that all goods that should move from one, that can move from one country to another, should have all exchange rates of, of one. Which is why the two things that economists use to look at prices are Big Macs and haircuts. Can you buy a haircut in Mexico and take and sell it in America? No, right? They, when, when economists are like, we need a good that you absolutely cannot import or export. Oh, haircuts, that's a good one. That's why they look at haircuts, does that make sense? Okay, because, so haircut doesn't have to abide by this rule that the real exchange rate should be one to one, right? Um, shoes should, it, should exchange, should, right? Because it's easy to export and import or something like that. Haircuts, no. Okay. So uh, let's think about how to calculate the real exchange rate with many goods. This is actually the exact same thing as what we did before. But instead of P being the price of the good, right? So when I'm looking at the real exchange rate, there's not just one pizza or one Big Mac out there in the economy, right? There's a bunch of things. So I'm going to look at the price of, not the price of just one good, I'm looking at the price of the shopping cart. Remember that from the CPI chapter? I'm just looking at the price of the shopping cart. The CPI, okay? All, it's the exact same formula. I just changed P instead of the price of the good. It's the price of the shopping cart. And then what? What do you think P star is? The price of the shopping cart in the other country's currency, okay? And that's the foreign price level. All right. And then uh, so my real exchange rate is the exact same formula: E times P over P star. And what that'll tell me is my shopping cart here in America, how much shopping carts, how many shopping carts can I buy if I exchange that money into a foreign currency? All right, so if the US real exchange rate appreciates, so this is, this is where you gotta try not to get confused with the exchange rate appreciating, right? The US real exchange rate appreciate, appreciates. Okay. That means that the basket of goods in America is getting more expensive than the basket of goods in another place, right? So it means the goods in America are getting more expensive vis-a-vis -vis the other nation's goods, okay? That's what it means for the U.S. real exchange rate to appreciate. So technically, right, 
For exporters, this is really bad. If the US real exchange rate appreciates, it's bad for exporters because that means United States goods are getting more expensive. Not as many people are going to want to buy United States goods when they're getting more expensive, so our exports go down. It's good for importers, right? Because, oh, goods in the United States are getting too expensive. These goods are cheaper. Let's go ahead and buy them in another place and import them. Okay, does that make sense? All right, so let's now talk about this idea. It's called the law of one price, right? And, and I think you were already figuring out this law in your brain. You're like, the price should be the same for goods that can, we can move from one country to another. The price should be the same. Right? And we're talking about the real exchange rate price. Right? So we call that the law of one price. A good should sell for the same price in all markets. Why? Because otherwise I just go buy it where it's cheaper and sell it where it's more expensive and I make free money here. Okay? And so here's the idea. And this is this is the arbitrage opportunity. Um, suppose coffee sells for four dollars a pound in Seattle and five dollars a pound in Boston, and you can just ship it there costlessly. What is everybody going to do? They're going to buy the coffee in Seattle and take it and sell it in Boston. That's cool. Art. So, right? Let's imagine what's going to end up happening. If if the prices were were like this, four dollars and five dollars, everybody's going to buy the coffee where? In Seattle. Yeah. And they're going to sell it where? In Boston. So that's going to make the demand curve for coffee in Seattle go up, which is going to make this price go up. It's going to make the demand for bought the coffee in Boston go down, which is going to make this price go down. And what will happen? They'll both get to the same price because of arbitrage, because of these handy people that are out there trying to make a quick buck without actually any production, just by transferring. Okay. So, uh, yeah, sorry, so that's just what I said. Right? The arbitrage drives up the price in Seattle, drives down the price in Boston until the two prices are equal. So the law of one price seems like it should hold, at least for goods that can be transported costlessly, right? Haircuts, you can't be trans transported, so haircuts can have a different price. Right? And actually, even in America, this holds, right? When I'm driving through Irvine, haircuts cost like 30 bucks a pop. I'm not even kidding, right? When I'm driving through Santa Ana, there's actually a ton of places that have haircuts, and they're like eight bucks. There's no arbitrage opportunity. You can't grab, because incomes on average are lower in that portion um, of, of, of Orange County, you can't grab a haircut and take it and sell it in Irvine and make money. You can't bring the prices together. Okay. So this brings us to the idea of purchasing power parity, or PPP, all right? which says that the goods should have the real exchange rate or the same real exchange rate, right? The law of one price means the goods have the real exchange rate of one. So that means the nominal exchange rate just adjusts so that the real exchange rate ends up being one. That's what purchasing power parity means, all right? It just means that the, the real exchange rate just moves so that we can buy the same quantity of goods in all countries. So that if $2.50 buys a Big Mac here in the United States, when I change it, to Japanese yen, I should still be able to buy a Big Mac in Japan, right? So it comes from the law of one price, and it implies that the only reason why nominal exchange rates change is to equalize the price of the basket of goods across countries. So this is the other main reason that interest rates change. I think you asked this earlier, why does this interest rate change? The first is, well, maybe people just want Canadian dollars or want United States dollars. The other is the exchange rates change so that the real exchange rate always stays at one to one. Okay. Now, when real exchange rate is one, let's imagine that the basket contains a Big Mac. So, the price of the Big Mac in U.S. dollars is P. Right? This is the same exact problem where we just do the law of one price. The P star is the price of the Japanese Big Mac. And the E is the exchange rate, right? So I want you to think about something. Before we said that the real exchange rate was equal to what? The nominal exchange rate times the price here over the price there. Yeah? Well, if 
the law of one price holds, what is the real exchange rate? What should it be? One, right? It should be one to one. So let's go ahead and make this one. Now what do you notice that I can do? Very simply, I can take this P, right, and I move it right here, right? So I have that P star equals E, now I'm going to drink times the price here, okay? Which is where I start, right there, right? That's how I got this, okay? E, 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 now I'm change rate times the price level. Here equals the price level there. Okay. Now I can do a, uh, this idea. So E times P, remember, is the price of the Big Mac in yen, the price of the U.S. Big Mac in yen, and that's what this is, right? Price of the U.S. Big Mac, and I transfer it to yen, should equal the price of the Big Mac, the Japanese Big Mac, in yen, right? It's the same Big Mac, okay? So if I get E all by itself, I just go ahead and divide both sides by P, I get that the nominal exchange rate is equal to P star over P, meaning the price there divided by the price of the good here. That's the nominal exchange rate. This doesn't always hold. This is an assumption, right? What did I base this assumption on? This, right here, that the real exchange rate is equal to one. If at any time the real exchange rate is not equal to one, guess what? Does this hold anymore? No. This is just an assumption based on, we kind of thought it up in our head, right? So, this isn't necessarily always going to be true because there are some goods for which the real exchange rate is not one, like haircuts, right? So when I do exchange rates for the whole country, for all of the dollars, some of the dollars are used to buy haircuts, some of them are used to buy Big Macs. Yeah, maybe Big Mac has a real exchange rate of one to one, but haircuts maybe is 25 to one, right? So the real exchange rate is not going to be exactly equal to the purchasing power of parity predicted one, right? We call this the PPP predicted. Um, real exchange rate, okay? So what does this mean? So here's my formula. Well, this means that the nominal exchange rate should be related to the price levels, right? So let's go to the whole country model, not the one Big Mac model, right? The whole country model. So this is the price of a shopping cart in foreign money, right? P star, the price of the shopping cart in the foreign money this is the price of the shopping cart here. Okay. Remember, we use the price of the shopping cart to look for inflation, right? When the price of the shopping cart gets more expensive, I know it's just inflation. Okay? So look, if the two countries have different levels of inflation, what's going to happen to E? Is it going to stay the same? No, it will change. Right? So let's think about this. Imagine that there's higher inflation in Mexico. Look at the formula. Higher inflation in Mexico. Which part of this formula is going to change? Higher inflation in a foreign country. P star, P -star is going to change, right? So if P star changes, what's that going to make? It gets bigger. Higher inflation means P star is going to be bigger. What's that going to do to the, the nominal exchange rate? Make it bigger. So at first, one US dollar was maybe only equal to 13 Mexican pesos, right? And then the next day, when inflation happened, one US dollar is equal to 15 Mexican pesos. Do you see that? That's what happened right there. It got 15, because Mexico had higher inflation, so the exchange rate hot it went up to a higher one. Which, now here's the hard question. Which, uh, what did the US dollar do? Did it appreciate or depreciate? Okay, let me ask you this. What did the Mexican peso do? Did the Mexican peso appreciate or depreciate? Appreciate. It depreciated. Remember, when the number gets bigger, it means depreciate. Because imagine you're in Mexico, right? You're in Mexico, you're tr in this stage, you're trying to buy a US dollar. It only costs you 13 pesos, right? But then the next day, all of a sudden, the US dollar is costing you 15 pesos. That means the value of your Mexican peso is not, not as much, right? So the Mexican is depreciating, right? Even though the number is getting bigger, the Mexican is depreciating. It's the United States dollar that's appreciating, okay? So what happens? When goods in Mexico get more expensive, when there's inflation in Mexico, side note, what always causes inflation? Government, Government printing too much money. Good, okay, that's side note. Nothing to do with, well, it has something to do with this, but. So when the government, this is totally a 
test question I could ask you, right? When the government in Mexico prints too much money, what happens to the US dollar, uh, to the Mexican peso? Does it appreciate or depreciate? And you're like, how are those things even related? Oh my goodness, <laughs> right? So let's think it through, right? When the Mexican government prints too much money, okay, P star goes up, which means the nominal exchange rate goes up, which means that it, one US dollar maybe was 13 and then it went to 15. So that means the Mexican peso is depreciating with respect to the United States dollar, okay? And that's basically what we have here, right? If the inflation is higher in Mexico, the dollar gets stronger, according to the peso gets weaker. If the inflation is higher in the United States, the dollar gets weaker and the peso gets stronger. You've got, to, you've got to be able to, that little trail of thought that I gave you, you've got to be able to do that. All right. So let's talk about some of the limitations here. Well, remember I, I told you that this is not all, the, the PPP exchange rate is not always the true exchange rate. That's just kind of our prediction, right? And here's why. One of them, many goods cannot easily be traded. What's the example good of a good that cannot be traded? Haircut. Not traded here. Oh, going to the movies, that's a good one too, right? You can't, you can't trade going to a movies. Okay? Um, so you can't have, you can't expect that the real exchange rate is going to be one because of arbitrage, because you can't do arbitrage on haircuts. Okay? And then the other thing is if the goods are actually slightly different, right? So if a Big Mac in the United States is a little bit different than a Big Mac in Japan, Maybe they're yummier in one of the places that it can cost a little more if it's yummier. Right. So, I mean, some U.S. consumers prefer Toyotas over Chevys. Or they prefer Chevys over Toyotas, depending on who you ask. I got people, members of my family who are like, oh, Toyotas are so much better than Chevys. And then the other people are like, oh, Chevys are so much better than Toyotas. And no, it doesn't really make sense to me. But, right? So they're not perfect substitutes. For whatever reason, Maybe just inside the person's brain, but uh, for whatever reason, they're not seen as, as perfect substitutes. Right, so, so the preferences of the people, is, is, it goes right in there. This is why the PPP exchange rate, the one that we predicted, you know, the PPP exchange rate is P star over P. That's not always the actual exchange rate, and it's because of these things, like preferences of the people. Some people, yeah, don't want different uh, Toyota's more than Chevy's. Okay. So they reflect the price differences, reflect people's tastes or their preferences. Um, so why did I even teach you PPP? Well, PPP especially works in the long run. Especially works in the long run. Okay, it's a really good explanation of why uh, exchange rates change. So if I look at the exchange rate of us and Mexico now, and then us and Mexico in 10 years, the difference in the exchange rate over that 10 years is probably exactly equal to the inflation rate, right? If I look at it today versus in a week from now, it might have changed and there was no change in the inflation rate. Well, PPP maybe doesn't work that well, right? But if I look at it over 10 years, it's really true, probably, that the only difference between our exchange rate now and, and in 10 years from now in the future is, go, is that um, just the inflation, excuse me, the only difference in the exchange rate is the inflation rates. Okay. Um, so, right, the greater a country's inflation rate, the faster its currency should depreciate relative to, like, the United States, where we have low inflation. So, I'm going to show you a graph that shows that the long, in the long run, this is sort of true. All right, let's look at this graph. So. Here we have, um, look, this was done over 10 years, right? Because PPP uh, idea, the inflation, really only kicks in to the exchange rate over the long run, right? So this is 10, 10 years. We see that as the inflation rate goes up versus America, look at what happens to the depreciation, pre depreciation versus America. Right? So these kind of, these are just 31 random countries, but these countries over here have a high rates of inflation. Right? They have high rates of depreciation, meaning they're getting weaker 
with respect to the dollar. Meaning that it was, you know, one dollar bought ten of them, then it was one dollar bought twenty of them, then it was one dollar bought thirty of them. Okay? So over the long run, right, over the 10 year period, 1993 to 2003, it looks like when you have higher inflation, that makes your P star go up, right? P star over P goes up, which makes your E go up, which means that your currency is getting weaker. Right? That's what this is showing. Because there's a, I mean, it's a pretty strong, right, uh, positively sloping line if you were to draw. Imagine a line going through here. All right. Uh, and here, oh, here's the, the uh, countries, right? Ukraine and Brazil, high rates of inflation. Argentina, Mexico, medium rates of inflation. Japan, almost no inflation. Right? Very low inflation. They've actually had deflation. Um, this is a long scale at one. So anything below one is actually deflation on this scale. So they've actually gotten stronger, according to the United States. All right, um, let's do this review questions and then we shall be done. So, uh, which of the following statements about a trade country with a trade deficit is not true? Exports less than imports? So this is a trade deficit, right? You gotta tell me if it's not true. Our trade deficit, does that mean exports less than imports? Does that mean net capital outflow less than zero? Does that mean investments less than saving? Does that mean Y is less than C plus I plus G? Right? So this will take a couple of minutes to figure out that one, go through each of them. And then I also want you to see uh, Ford Escape sells for $24,000 in the United States and 720000 in rubles in Russia. If PPP holds, what is the nominal exchange rate? So take a couple minutes to do those two problems, um, and then we'll come back to it. Okay, let's look at, uh, at part one. Uh, which of the following statements about a country with a trade deficit is not true? Okay. Trade deficit. Let's review what that means. What's going on over here with the trade deficit? Import over export. Right. So this is negative, which means imports are greater than exports. Okay. So imports greater than exports. Okay. That's true. Right. Net capital outflow is less than zero. Well, if NX is less than zero, we know that net capital outflow must be less than, less zero. than zero. Okay. All right. So, okay, B is good. Let's look at C. What do you guys think about C? Is that true? C is wrong. Yeah. So remember the this guy right here. Let's let's write this. Y equals C plus I plus G plus net exports. Let's rearrange that, put the C and the G on this side. We got Y minus C minus G equal to I plus net exports. This is actually savings, right? Okay, so I've got, this is a negative number, net exports, right? So whatever this is, let's imagine this is 200, and then I have some negative number, so savings is going to be smaller than investment. Savings smaller than investment. Ooh, that's not that one, right? Saving is definitely smaller than investment. Another way to think about it, right? A country with a trade deficit. That means that, let's imagine America, we got, we're a trade deficit. We're importing more than we're exporting. We're importing more. That means they have extra dollars over there that they can't use because I'm not giving them enough imports or enough exports for their dollars. There's extra dollars out there. They send them over here and buy my stock exchange, stuff from my stock exchange. The dollars are flowing in. That means American countries have all these extra dollars which they can do investment on, which is more than the people in the United States are saving. That's the other way to think about it, right? So I know that investment is actually bigger than savings. Because, yes, the United States people are saving some money, but the, the companies are investing even more because they're investing with United States money plus this foreigner money that's coming back in. Does that make sense? Yes. Investments should be greater than saving. And then, of course, Y should be less than C plus I plus G. Let's look at that. Um, this one. Obviously, we know that's true, but let's say that you couldn't figure that out C on a test and you have to check about D, right? Let's check if D is true. This, we know, is negative, right? So whatever C plus I plus G is, 
Then we have to add a negative number, make it smaller, and then it's equal to y. Right? So c plus i plus g, then we take off a little bit, and it's equal to y. That means that y must be smaller than c plus i plus g. Yeah? That's what we got there. Any questions on how that works? All right, so the right answer is C, because it's the wrong answer. <laughs> the right wrong one is C. OK? All right, let's do this next one. A Ford Escape sells for 24,000 in the US and 720,000 rubles in Russia. Let's imagine purchasing power parity holds. What's the nominal exchange rate? Right? So the real exchange rate is always equal to the exchange rate times the price here over the price there. That always holds, always. But for purchasing power parity, what's the assumption we're going to make here? This guy is 1. That's just for purchasing power parity. Right? We're going to say that 1 is equal to e times p over p star. Let's multiply both sides by p star. These cancel. We're going to have p star is equal to e times p. Let's divide both sides by p. These cancel. It implies that p star over p is equal to the nominal exchange rate with the PPP assumption. right? So now this is easy. Price there divided by the price here. What's the price there? 720,000. The price here is 24,000. 30 rubles per dollar. Right? 720,000 divided by 24,000 gives you 30. OK? Questions? Not too, too hard, but these are very, very close to test questions. <laughs> OK? So please, know how to do these. Kind of think about it if you had any questions. <laughs>